Hello and welcome. This complete course has been carefully created to teach HTML in the simplest and most practical way possible, including project-based and hands-on experience. Each part is followed by a knowledge exam, a project, or a side note. We will learn HTML by completing 11 projects, which will contain seven web pages or websites, two tables, and two forms. For practice, you will also be asked to complete nine projects and answer 53 challenge questions. This tutorial contains 11 videos in order. Sections of the tutorial are timestamped, and you can find them in the description down below, allowing you to quickly navigate to different parts of the video if you are looking for something specific. I am Michael with Easy Coding. This course requires no prior HTML knowledge. It covers enough fundamentals to take you from beginner to proficiency. And at the end, you can code like a pro. I am glad you are here, starting your web development journey. And it is a pleasure to be your guide in this course. So one of the next things we will do is gather the necessary tools and begin learning. To create an HTML web page, you need a code editor and a browser. This is the list of tools I will be using in these tutorials. For an IDE or code editor, I like to use Visual Studio Code, aka VS Code. You can use your favorite search engine and search for VS Code like uh, what I'm doing now. It is uh, the first option for me, so I click on it. This is the main page of the VS Code uh, website. VS Code is made by Microsoft and is one of the most used IDEs by developers and it is free. I am doing this course on a PC. VS Code is a cross-platform IDE that supports Windows, Mac, and Linux. If you want to install it, you can download it from this page. I have also created a main folder named Tutorials on my desktop. I am going to put uh, all the subfolders for these tutorials in there. You may want to do the same thing by creating a main folder on your computer, naming it whatever you like, and placing all the subfolders for these tutorials in it. To open a folder inside VS Code, in addition to these uh, keyboard shortcuts right here, if you don't uh, already have a folder open, you can click on this icon to open Explorer. Click on Open Folder button right here. Then look for the folder you want to open in my case is tutorials. Select it and click on this select folder button and you will open it in your VS Code. Or you can click on the file here, then click on the open folder we do the same thing. Look for the folder you want to open. Select it. 
and hit this select folder button right here to open it inside your VS Code. I am going to click on it and open my folder. Here it is. And I have these uh, icons next to it. The first one is for adding a new file. And this one is for creating a new folder. I want to add a subfolder now. I click on and I want to call it folder dash zero zero. and press the enter key here it is i have the folder now i want to add a file to it i make sure that i am adding it to this folder and nowhere else since the folder is highlighted i am good then i click on this icon and i name i name it index HTML and press the enter key. An HTML file must have the file extension .html to be recognized as an HTML file by browsers. Now I have an empty file over here. I am also using these extensions inside the VS Code. The first one is Emmet abbreviation. It is enabled by default in VS Code for HTML, CSS, and other file types. You can check the VS Code website for the Emmet default file type list and how you can add other file types. What Emmet does is, if I type an exclamation mark and uh, press the tab or enter key, Emmet will uh, fill this in for me. I hit the tab key now. Here they are. These are the basic pieces of information that we need to create an HTML file. Don't worry about them now. We will go over each of them later. Let's look at a few examples to see how Emmet works. If I type div and press the tab or enter key, I get this. This is a start tag and an end tag for a div element. I comment this out for your reference. It was div plus the tab or the enter key. Another example, if I type p.example and press the enter key, I get this. This is a p element, represents a paragraph. It has a class attribute. The class attribute has the value of example. I commented out, it was p.example plus the enter key. Uh, you can do tab or enter, either one works. Another example uh, could be like this. We do hashtag ID name and then uh, press the tab or enter key. 
and we get this one. Uh, this is again a, a div element. It has an ID attribute. The value of the ID attribute is ID name. What I did actually was I type hashtag ID name plus the tab or the enter key. Now well, let's have a couple more examples. Uh, the next one I want to do, how about this? We do div greater than p greater than a span. Press the tab key. I'm going to make a little change over here. I like it this way for a better uh, illustration. What I did, uh, it was, uh, I asked for a div element and uh, nest a p element inside it, and then nest a span element inside the p element. So the abbreviation was div greater than p greater than a span plus the tab or the enter key. And uh, let's uh, do one more. For this one, uh, I want to do this uh, ul greater than li times 5 and press the tab key. So uh, for this one, uh, what I ha have now is uh, an an ordered list contains five list item elements. The abbreviation was UL greater than LI times 5 plus the tab or enter key. If you want more information about the Emmet abbreviation, Check the Emmet abbreviation website and also you can search online for an Emmet cheat sheet as I am doing now. It is the first option for me, I click on it. This is the cheat sheet. You can check uh, Emmet documentation over here also. This is the Emmet website. Okay. The next extension is uh, Prettier. Prettier ensures that all output code confirms to a consistent style. This is how it works. When you save your code, it checks and formats it for style consistency. Look at these and these over here. I just typed uh, an exclamation mark and press the tab key. I didn't do anything as far as uh, formatting or indenting. The reason uh, these have format and proper indentations is because Prettier did it. If I change them, such as these, uh, let's uh, move this all the way over here. Or let's say I was a sloppy and type all of these over here. 
As soon as I save the file, uh, Prettier will format them again. Here it goes. Here. If you click on this extension, aka uh, the marketplace, and search for Prettier, here is the first one for me. I click on it. I expand this. And here is more information about Prettier. Check it out. If uh, you like it, install it. Please keep in mind that uh, Prettier does not validate your code. Let's go back to the file. Down over here on the status bar, this is the Prettier. If uh, there is an error in your code, you will get a warning and it turns orange over here. Let's uh, add another closing tag here and save the file. As you may have noticed, the uh, prettier shows a warning and turns orange. If I click on it and scroll up, and we will uh, see the line number and the error message. The error message indicates there are two closing tags for the body element. If uh, you don't fix the error, Prettier will stop formatting and styling your code going forward. It uh, starts uh, formatting and styling your code again once you fix the error. Let's uh, get uh, rid of this uh, extra closing tag and save the file. Here we go. We are good to go. The next uh, extension is a live server. The live server is a development local server with live reload feature. It works like this. Whenever you make changes to your code or write a new code and save it, the live server automatically refreshes the local host browser and you will see the changes on the screen. This is uh, my live server. It's not running now. I click on it to get it going. This is my local uh, host browser. It shows five dots. Uh, these five dots are because of this uh, an order list. It has five list item elements inside it. Uh, these uh, list items, they don't have description. That's why it just shows those dots. Uh, let's add something over here, okay? If I type, hello, world and as soon as I save the file you will see it on the screen here it goes this is how the live server works it is convenience you don't have to go back and forth and click on the file in order to uh, display it on the browser and it doesn't matter uh, how small or large is the change uh, you are making. Uh, uh, as soon as you save the file, it displays it on the localhost browser. Again, uh, you can go to this extension, type for live server. This is the first one again. Click on it, expand this. This is information about 
the live server. And again, if you want to have it, uh, go ahead and install it. The next uh, extension is a uh, code spell checker. The code spell checker, it is a basic spell checker that works well with code and documents. The spell checker helps catch common spelling errors. Uh, for example, if I'm going to have a P element over here, and type we are checking and uh, as you notice i misspelled the the word checking on purpose if i hover over it uh, this window uh, appears uh, there are two options over here if i uh, if I select a quick fix, I get this uh, recommendation. And the first one is checking. If I uh, click on it, it fixes it. Here we go. This is how uh, the code spell checker works. Again, if you go to a mark the marketplace and type Code the spell checker and click on it. Let's let's expand this. And here is uh, information about it. Again, uh, if you are interested, uh, go ahead and help yourself install it. The next thing uh, I want uh, to talk about is. Uh, about the uh, browsers which browser you use is a personal preference and please be aware that uh, each browser has different default settings your code should work on all of them but the outcome that is displayed on the screen may be different depending on the browser default setting I use uh, Google Chrome and Chrome DevTools for these uh, tutorials. Again, uh, if you don't have uh, Google Chrome, uh, you can go online and search for it. Like so. And here it is, the first one again. It's from a Google website. Uh, if you don't have it and uh, you like to install it, go ahead and do it from over here. We will also learn to use the World Wide Web Consortium, aka W3C Markov Validation Service. As I mentioned earlier, Prettier does not validate your code. It just formats and styles it. It is a good practice to run your code through the W3C validation service to be on the safe side. If you need to install the VS Code and Google Chrome, go ahead and do so and come back. Now that we have our IDE and browser installed, we can go on with the remaining tutorials. Let's begin with the meaning of acronym HTML. The most basic building block of the web and the primary language used for creating all web pages is the hypertext markup language, aka HTML. Simply put, 
We use HTML to tell a browser to display our web page content the way we intend it. Hypertext is text that contains links to other texts. Web pages connect by using hypertext links for a variety of devices. Hypertext link is also known as hyperlink. A markup language is a computer language used to define and present text. HTML is an example of a markup language. Before we start writing a web page, we need to learn HTML comments, tags, elements, and attributes. I want to create a subfolder inside my main folder and name it folder-01. I also add a file to it and name it index.html. If I type an exclamation mark and press the tab key, VS Code fills in some basic requirements for our HTML file. We begin with the HTML comments. In VS Code, the control key plus the slash key displays a comment like this. Anything between these is an HTML comment. They are not uh, visible on the web page. The browser ignores comments as it renders the code. HTML comments are useful. For example, we can write detailed notes about our code or comment out a section of our code for testing or debugging. For example, let's say I have a P element contains uh, some text, I type lorem and press the tab key. If I, if I highlight the entire paragraph and hold down the control key and hit the slash key, I commented out like this. You can uncomment it the same way by highlighting the entire paragraph and holding down the control key and hitting the slash key. And I commented out again, uh, we don't need it here. HTML is using tags for its syntax. HTML elements usually comes in tag pairs. A pair of tags consists of angle brackets and the tag name like these. The start tag and end tag. The end tag is the same as the start tag uh, with a slash in front of the tag name. Uh, for example, as we have uh, seen earlier, these are a pair of div tags. An element uh, consists of a start tag to indicate where it begins and an end tag to indicate uh, where it ends. The contents of the element must be placed after the start tag and before the end tag. 
For example, this is an H2 heading element. I add the two uh, HR elements here. Uh, the HR element is usually used as a horizontal rule to separate content. There are uh, two categories of elements in HTML inline elements and block level elements. Inline elements take up the width of their contents. They don't stretch beyond their contents. An inline element will not cause a new line to appear in the document. They are usually used within block level elements. Generally, Inline elements may contain only data and other inline elements. An exception is the inline element A, aka the anchor element, which may contain block level elements such as div. For a better illustration, I have prepared a very basic style sheet in the file style.css and add it here. One way uh, to add a style sheet to a page is by using the link element. The REL attributes uh, describes the relationship between the document and the linked resource. In this case, uh, the style sheet. The href attribute, aka hypertext reference, specifies the location of the resource, which is the style.css. To continue, we start with a div element as a, a container. The place uh, the following inline elements in it. Uh, the first element uh, the, is a, a span element. Uh, it is an inline element and it is a generic inline container for phrasing content. To speed uh, things up, I will copy and paste uh, as needed. The span element has a class attribute with the value of a span-1. The reason I have these class attributes here is I use them in the style.css file to give these elements different colors. If I save the file and fire up my live server, we can see it on the screen. Here it is. This is the span element. As we know, uh, inline elements take up the width of their contents. So that's why it didn't go further than its content. Another inline element is the EM element. It marks text that has a stress emphasize. It basically means that 
extra force is put on a text to make it seem uh, more important. And browsers uh, display it uh, in italic. This is the EM element. Uh, here I uh, copy and paste once again. I also use a mark element inside the EM element uh, to highlight these two words. As I mentioned earlier, inline elements may contain only data and other inline element. I save the file and we look at it on the screen. Here it is. This is the EM element with the mark element highlighting these two words. As you see, the inline element they sit next to each other. I add another span element here. Again, I copy and paste. And if I uh, save the file, uh, we see it on the screen. Here it is. Again, uh, they are sitting next to each other nicely. Uh, this is how the inline elements behave. Lastly, let's have a strong element. It is an inline element and indicates uh, that its contents have a strong importance, seriousness or urgency. Browsers uh, typically render their contents in bold type. Uh, once more, I copy and paste over here. This is the strong element. And then I'm going to save the file to see it on the screen. Here it is. This is uh, how inline element behaves. They don't add a line to the document and they sit next to each other. And as you see, I have them in different colors. So they are actually just next to each other, like this. Block level elements form a visible block because they take up all the width available to them. They stack vertically on a page. They appear on a new line with a space above and below. The spacing is because of the browser's default CSS styling. This H2 element over here, the heading, as you may have noticed, it has a space below and above. It is a block level element. The P element is a block level element. Again, I do uh, copy and paste here. This, this P element has a class attribute p-1 and some text in it. I save the file and uh, we see it on the screen. The div element is a generic block level element. It is a container to group content. It has no effect on the content or layout until styled in some way 
using CSS. As a pure container, it does not inherently represent anything. Use it when no other semantic element is appropriate. We talk about semantic elements later. Again, I do some copy and paste over here. And I save the file. And here it is. As uh, you may have noticed, these uh, block level elements, they have a space above and below. This H2 also has a space above and below. And they take the entire space available to them. So it goes all the way. That's why I use the different colors to illustrate them. See this uh, H2 element? It's all the way from over here to over here. I centered the text. But over here, uh, for the P element, I didn't center the text. So as you see it, it is from over here to over here. All the way is the P element. And the div element also, this yellow, is the entire div element. Let's have uh, another P element. I save it uh, to see it on the screen. Again, uh, because uh, that P element, uh, this uh, green niche P element is a block level element, even it has two words, hello word in it, it takes all the way to over here, the available space to it. So this is how uh, block level elements works. Uh, Block level elements are usually structural elements on the page. For example, a block level element may represent headings, as we saw several of it, paragraphs, a list, navigation menu, or footers. A block level element wouldn't be nested inside an inline element, but it may be nested inside another block level element. I add another HR over here. Horizontal rules, aka HR element, is a block level element. I'll save it again, so we have it over here. Next, we begin with a section. A section is a generic uh, sectioning element and should only be used if there isn't a more specific element to represent it. Section is a block level element. Sections should have heading. I add an H3 heading over here. Again, I do some copy and paste. If I save the file, we see it on the screen. I add a paragraph inside the section and add the some text to it. Uh, I use a uh, lorem epsom. I type lorem and press the tab key. I need uh, more, so I uh, more takes. Uh, I uh, do it one more time. I think it is good enough now. Uh, if I save the file, let me see it on the screen like this. As you see, uh, it is a chunk of uh, text over here. 
If you use uh, indentations or excess white space inside your text, browsers will ignore it and you will not see it on your page. Uh, for example, if I make an indentation like this over here, and I save the file, you don't see it on the screen, okay? One way uh, to make indentation is uh, to add the line break element. And also, if you have excess uh, white space, let's say you have several space over here like this, browser sees it as just one space. And again, uh, one way to uh, have an indentation in your text uh, to use uh, line break elements, I'm going to use uh, some over here. And again here. Now, if I save the file, then we see the indentation. Here it is. Some elements don't have intact, like HR element, line break element, aka carriage return, or the image element. The image element is used to embed an image into a document. These elements don't have intact and are called void elements. A void element is an element that cannot have any child nodes. In other words, uh, cannot have nested elements or text. For example, let's add an image to our page. I have already uh, added an image to this folder, this image, and we are going to use it here. The SR attribute uh, is short for source, it specifies the location of a file or URL for a link. The image I am using is in the same uh, folder. I just need to add the file name like this. The alt attribute defines an alternate text description of the image. The user will see this description if, for any reason, the image is not displayed. Also, a screen readers will read this description aloud for their users. I add the description of, let's say, flowers. All right. Also, uh, let's add the width and height for our uh, image. Uh, I would say the width of 400 pixel and the height of 250 pixel. Let's save uh, the file and then uh, we should see the image on the screen. Here it goes. Yep, here it is. As you may have noticed, uh, the image element doesn't have the end tag. Uh, void elements also called empty elements. Let's talk about attributes. 
We have already seen a few of them almost everywhere on this page. An element can have attributes to specify its characteristic. Attributes are specified on the start tag. They consist of a name and a value separated by an equal sign. The image element, for example, has five attributes. I added the class attribute and used it in the CSS file to center the image on the screen. It is recommended that you code all attributes. You can use double quotation marks or single quotation marks. I prefer double quotation marks. It is a best practice to validate your code using the W3C validation service. Finding errors in a small, straightforward HTML document is simple. Doing so in a large, complex HTML document is more difficult. Let's have a, a div element and nest a p element and an a element aka anchor element in it So I have a div element, nested the p element and an a element in it. If you are using the emit, the abbreviation was I am doing some uh, copy and paste here. The div element has a class uh, attribute uh, with the value of div-3. The p element has uh, this text in it. And the a element has a trip attribute, the value of the trip attribute is the link to the W3C validation service page. It has also a target attribute. The target attribute has the value of underscore blank uh, because we want them to open it in a new window and also has a description. Uh, let's save the file and uh, see it on the screen. Here it is. If I click on the link uh, to make sure you have it, yes, here it is. This is the markup validation service page from the W3C. I add another HR element here. The last thing uh, we want to add to our page is uh, a footer element and a p element inside it. The footer element is a block level element. I save the file. 
here it is. Let's expand this. This is our web page from the beginning all the way to the end. Let's uh, validate our file. I expand this. When you are on this page, you have three options. I like this one. And I choose this one to upload the file. Then I press uh, the choose file button here. This is my index.html highlighted. Press open. I have the file here, then I click this button, the check button. And document checking completed and no errors or warning to show. So I got this screen now. So this is how you use the W3C markup validation service. And let's do something over here. Let's uh, misspell the alt like this and save the file and go back and check our file one more time. I have the file over here. I just click the check button over here. This time we have two errors. The first one it says the attribute AL not allowed on element uh, image at this point. And they give us the line number and the column number. This is the list of uh, allowed attribute on the, an element image. The second error, it says an image element must have an alt attribute again give us the line number and the column for it let's go back and uh, fix the problem here it is and uh, save the file we go back and run it again we are good this time <clears throat> this is how you use uh, and uh, the validation service uh, to check your file. It's very convenient, uh, especially if you have a large file. Let's comment out the link for the style.css file here. And uh, save uh, our file. And uh, look at it on the screen. As you can see, the HTML documents are readable in a browser. What you are seeing are the browser's default styles. The browser applies very basic styles to HTML to ensure that the document is readable even if no styles are specified by the author. And let's open uh, the Chrome DevTools and take a closer look at the browser's default style. Chrome DevTools is a set of web developer tools built directly into the Google Chrome browser. You can search for uh, Chrome DevTools online. Like so. It is the first option for me. I click on it. This is the main Chrome DevTools page where you can find all the information you need and learn how to use all of its features. To access the DevTools from a page, you can right-click on the page, 
and select an aspect right here. Or on Windows or Linux, press the F12 key. On Mac, press Command plus Option plus C as a Charlie. I click on an aspect. Here it is my dev tools. I like it to be on the left side of the screen. If you click on these dots, you have the options to choose which dock you want. There are four options over here. Also, if you click on this cog, you can change the setting over here. If I hover over the HTML element right here, it highlights the whole page. As you can see, everything is nested inside the HTML element. And also, if I hover over here on the box model, this is the main content of the HTML element. The HTML element is the root element. The head element right here is the part of our page that we don't want visitors to see. As you can see, the browser did not render it. It's not displayed. This is a CSS rule. The display is the CSS property and the none is its value. This is the browser style sheet. The user agent is another name for the browser. The browser knows this is the head element and it must not be displayed. So it has given the display property the none value. The next element is the body element right here. If I hover uh, over the box model and this is the main content of the body element. As you have seen, it has eight pixel margin for the top, right, bottom, and the left side. The next element is this H2 element. H2 element, uh, the heading element, is a block level element. And we know it has a space above and below as we see it over here. This is the main content. And these are the, sp the space above and below. The browser gave it almost 20 pixels for the top and 20 pixels for the bottom margin. The next uh, element uh, we want to talk about it uh, is this, uh, these HR elements. These HR elements, uh, the HR element is a block level element. That's why they have a space above and below. There you go, eight pixel for above and eight pixel for the below. The top margin and the bottom margin. That's the top one and then the second one is this one. Next element is uh, this div element over here. The div element is a noun semantic generic container. You can use it when no other semantic element 
can be used instead of it. It is a block level element, but as you see, uh, the browser didn't give him any margin. The space you see above and below that, that belongs to those uh, HR element. The space above is uh, this one, this HR element. And this is the space above this HR element. And this is the space below, again, another this HR element. The next uh, element we want to talk about it is the this section. Uh, the section element is a semantic element. It, you should use it for grouping uh, related content, and it should have a heading. As you have seen, we have this uh, H3 heading over here. Again, the browser didn't give it any margin. It looks like a, the div element, but it's not. The div element is non-semantic. It's not a semantic element, but the section element is a semantic element. The space you see above and below it is belong to the, actually it is belong to this H3. And the one at the bottom of it, right here, the, over here is, this is another P element over here. This P element right here. The next element I want to talk about is uh, the image element. We know uh, that the image element is a void element or an empty element, and it is also an inline element. Here it is. And as you have noticed, the browser didn't add anything to it. The dimension you see over here, we added to the image element by using the attribute style and we gave it uh, 400 pixels for web and 250 pixels for the height. The next item, uh, we talk about P element. We know uh, the P element is a uh, a block level element it has a space above and below, and we know uh, where those spaces uh, come from. Let's talk about this A element over here. The A element also is an inline element. As you have noticed, it then stretch beyond its content. The next element is the footer element. This is the main content of the footer element. The space above and below it uh, belongs to the P element inside it, this P element. The footer element is a semantic element. Okay, that was the last element. Uh, by the way, if uh, you notice this uh, script over here, this is the browser script. If you expand it, you see a bunch of uh, script code there. The Chrome DevTools are a very useful tool for developers. Try to use it. Test your knowledge is the next screen. To learn a programming language, one magical key is practice. The more you practice, the better you get. It is also important to remember the concept of the code and how it works. Please complete them all. Watch the video again and repeat them if needed until you are comfortable with them. We make a web page by combining various elements. 
please keep in mind it is crucial to use different elements correctly and understand what they signify semantically. Semantic elements are useful because they enable screen readers, search engines, and other computer devices to adequately read and comprehend the content on our page. Semantics refer to the meaning of a piece of code in programming, or what purpose or role an HTML element has. Most browsers, for example, consider an H1 element to be a top-level heading and will style it with a large font size to make it look like a top-level heading on a page. If you are not certain which element to use, ask yourself what element best describes or represents the data that I am going to include within it. I already created another folder, named it folder-02. Inside it, I have an empty index.html file. You may be wondering why I use index.html as a file name. The common file name that serves as the default or main page is index.html. Web servers are looking for it as the default or main page. If you use a different file name instead of uh, index.html, you must uh, include it in the URL in order for it to be your default or entry page. Now, now is a good time to talk about file names rules. We know HTML files must have the .html file extension to be recognized by the browser as a web document. For file names, must use only alphabets, numbers, hyphen, and underscore. Use lowercase letters in file and folder names. Although not required, it is best practice. Also, it is helpful to develop consistent naming conventions. Look, the Google search engine treats a hyphen as a word separator, but does not see an underscore that way. For these reasons, it is best to get into the habit of writing your folder and file names in lowercase with no spaces and with words separated by hyphens. As I said, although not required, it is best practice. Next, we talk about anatomy of an HTML document. I type uh, exclamation mark and press the tab key. All right. Uh, let's uh, start from the top. We have doc type declaration, which uh, it is not an element. Doc types are required for legacy reasons to make sure your document behaves correctly and it is not case sensitive. A duct type must consist of all of these angle brackets uh, and all the way to over here and it could also be in lowercase. Next, there is uh, the HTML uh, element. 
This element, the HTML element, contains all the content on the entire uh, page. And as I mentioned before, uh, represents the root of an HTML document. The HTML uh, element uh, should always have a lang attribute. The lang attribute uh, specifies uh, the primary language for the contents of the element. For example, en means English. Next is the head element. The head element is a container for all elements that are related to the document and you don't want to show them to the viewers of your page like uh, title, a style sheet, a script, keyword, and the page description that appears in search result, uh, character set, and uh, more things. We know the content of head element is not displayed on the page when loaded in a browser. Metadata is data that describes data. Meta element or a meta tag is used to add metadata to a document. There are different types of uh, meta elements that can be added in the head element of a document. The character encoding used by the document is specified by the character set attribute for the metadata. This means the document is allowed to use UTF-8 character set that includes almost any character from the human languages. For example, your page could handle English, Farsi, or Chinese very well. This meta tag uh, specifies which version of Internet Explorer should be used to display your page. It will not allow your page to be rendered as an older version of Internet Explorer. The Edge mode over here tells the Internet Explorer to display content in the highest possible mode. This viewport meta tag ensures the page renders at the width of viewport. It tells browsers how to control the page's dimensions and prevent a small devices browsers from rendering pages wider than the viewport. The viewport is the portion of the screen that you can see. When a page is larger than the viewport, Browsers provide scroll bars so that user can access the page's content by scrolling. And next, uh, we add a meta tag and uh, use it to add the author's name. I do some copy and paste over here. This is the meta tag. Uh, the name attribute has the value of author, and the content is the author name, which is my name. Having an author is useful to be able to know who wrote the page if you have any questions about the content. We add another meta tag uh, and use it to add a description uh, for our page, uh, again, I do some copy and paste here. This is the meta tag for the description. Again, the name attribute uh, has the value of description and the content has a, a description about the page as you can see it on the screen. Specifying a description that includes keywords relating to the content of your page is useful. 
as it has the potential to make your page appear higher in relevant searches performed in search engines. The title element is metadata that represents the title of the overall HTML document. Web page's title is specified by the title element. I do some copy and paste over here again. And this is the title of our page. Title is used in the title bar of the web browsers, users, history, bookmarks, or in search results. The next element is the body element. The body element contains all the content that we want our website's visitors to see. The first element inside the body element could be a header. The header is usually a big strip across the top with a large heading that describe uh, your website, logo, slogan, and uh, navigational links. The header for a website usually stays uh, the same from one page to another. Let's add the header element here with uh, an H1 element inside it. Uh, let's save our file and uh, look at it on the screen. This is the header, the H1 element, and this is the title of our page. Remember, we had a title, the anatomy of an HTML document. This is the title. It appears over here. Navigation bar uh, is usually represented uh, by menu buttons, links, or tabs. Like the header, this content usually remains uh, consistent from one page to another. The navigation bar is usually a part of the header rather than an individual component, but uh, that's not a requirement. The next uh, one is uh, the footer element. We know footer is a strip across the bottom of the page that generally contains fine print, copyright notices, or contact information. The footer is also uh, sometimes used for uh, SEO, uh, search engine optimization purposes, by providing links for quick uh, access to popular uh, content. We saw uh, footer before. We add additional contents like paragraphs, images, tables, videos, forms, etc. in the area between the header and the footer. I add just four P elements here for a demonstration and I do some copy and paste again. Here they are. I just add these uh, four paragraphs uh, with the some text in it 
Um, as you have uh, noticed, the texts are from lorem ipsum also. So let's uh, save the file and see it on the screen. Here they are. And let's add a, a footer here uh, with uh, an, a span element inside it. And uh, save the file. And we should see it on the screen. Here it is. Let's add some styles to our file for a better illustration. I have prepared a basic style sheet in the file style.css and added here. We add it to our file. Okay, uh, let's uh, save the file and see it on the screen. Here it is. The header, the footer, and uh, we added everything else in between them. As you may have seen on the test your knowledge page, there is a side note that contains important points you may want to consider when you are writing your pages. You must structure your web page properly in order for a browser to display it the way you intended. Most structured text is made up of headings and paragraphs, like that found in a newspaper or magazine. Now let's make an HTML document. I have already created another folder and named it folder-03. Inside it, I have an index.html file. I type an exclamation mark and press the tab key. We begin with a header, an h1 heading, and a nav element. We give the header a class attribute. And we use uh, this class attribute later. There are six heading elements in HTML which are specified by h1 through h6. Each heading element represents a different level of content in the document. h1 heading represents the main heading, h2 element represents subheadings, h3 element represents sub subheadings, and so on.
It is entirely up to you to determine what the elements represent, as long as the hierarchy makes sense. Use only one H1 element per page. This is the top level heading that describes the page's content. And all others are sitting below it in the hierarchy. Make sure to use the headings in the correct hierarchical order. Don't use H3 elements to represent subheadings followed by H2 elements to represent sub-subheadings. We add a nav element here and we give it a class attribute As I mentioned before, div and span elements are generic, sort of noun semantic elements, and tell nothing about their content. Div is a block level element, and span is, a in, span is an inline element for phrasing content. The nav element, the nav element. Uh, is a container like the div element, but it is not generic. It was introduced as part of the HTML5 semantic tags. We use it as a container for our navigation bar here. We add four A elements within the nav element and give him a class attribute with the value of nav-a. We give the first one the description of uh, about I'm going to copy and paste this three more times. In VS Code, if you hold down the Shift and Alt key and uh, hit the down arrow key, you copy the highlighted uh, part of your code, like what I did. And then uh, I give the second one uh, the description of products. And let's do the third one, services. The last one, the contact, contact. If I can spell the contact, contact. The href attribute contains a URL or a URL fragment that the hyperlink points to. A hashtag specifies an internal target location within the current document. For example, you can use a href with the value of hashtag top or the empty fragment uh, href with the value hashtag to link to the top of the current page, like this. We continue with a section element, which represents a standalone section of a document for grouping related content.
for example, uh, chapters or the numbered section of a group a study or a website, the homepage could be split into sections for an introduction, news items, and contact information. The section element, as we know, is not a generic container. It is a semantic element and should have a heading. We add an H2 element. We used an H1 element for the heading in the header. Now we use an H2 element here for the correct hierarchical order. We add a P element we know represents a paragraph and it acts as a container for text. HTML paragraphs can be any grouping of related content, such as images or form field. We also add the same lorem epsom text placeholder to it. Let's save our file and uh, look at it on the screen. Here it is. We have the H1 element over here. These are our navigation bar. And this is the header, the heading for our section. We know the image element is a void or empty element and cannot have a child node or text. But we can use the figure and fig caption elements to add a caption to an image. So let's do that. We add an image with a caption and a button inside our section. We start with the figure element. And we add our image inside it. I have the image in the same folder. I have it over here. It is important that you enter the correct path or URL here. In my case, uh, since I have the image in the same folder, just need to enter the image name like this. And uh, we know uh, we have to give it a alt a description so uh, for this image, uh, I would say I give it this uh, description. Uh, then also uh, we give it an uh, ID attribute, uh, we use it later. And also we give it a class attribute. Again, we use it later. And uh, we give it uh, a width and height uh, also. So would be let's say 350 pixels for the width and we give it the height of 220 pixels okay and then uh, uh, let's save the file and see it on the screen here it is uh, we have the figure element 
here, the figure element. And uh, we added uh, our image element inside it. And we gave him all these attributes. Now uh, we want to add a caption to it. So uh, we use the feed caption feed caption element. The feed caption element can be placed at the bottom or top of the image. I have it at the bottom here. So the caption is going to be at the bottom of the image right here. If I want it to be at the top of the image, I would actually have it over here. I put the feed caption over here. Then I have the caption at the top or right here. For caption, I add the And I save the file, and here is the caption. And let's add a button to our page. We start with a div element as a container, add an H3 element and a button inside of it. We give our div element an ID attribute. For simplicity, we give it a value of div-1. Now we add uh, our button over here. And we give it the description of click me. And also uh, let's give him some attribute like ID, ETN. And the type is going to be button. And also we give it the class attribute. Again, BTN is good. Okay. Let's save it and look at it on the screen. Here it is. Uh, this is our H3 heading, and this is the button. A button with the type button has no default behavior. You can make it perform an action using JavaScript. Uh, let's uh, make it to do something, uh, like uh, toggle images. I have prepared an index.js file with some simple JS code inside it. Let's add it to our file. This is the file right here. This is our index.js file. And we also uh, change the description for our button. like this. We know there are different ways to load the JavaScript on our page. The most reliable way for modern browsers is to add a script element to the head element of our page and include the JS file like this.
make sure you add the defer attribute here. If you don't, your code won't work because the HTML on a page is loaded in the order in which it appears. It means the H1 heading is loaded first, then the navigation bar, then uh, the section at the H2 element and the paragraph and so on. If you are using JavaScript uh, to manipulate elements on the page, or uh, more accurately, uh, the document object model, aka DOM, your code won't work if the JavaScript is loaded and parsed before the HTML body is parsed. The defer attribute here tells the browser to continue downloading the HTML content and the script is executed when the page has been parsed. Let's also change the caption uh, for our image. I am doing some uh, copy and paste here. Uh, let's save our file and uh, give it a try. It works nicely. Next is article element. The article element represents a self-contained composition in a document. It is meant to be distributed independently of the rest of the site. For example, a forum post, a magazine or newspaper article, user comments, or a blog entry. We begin with uh, an article element, then add uh, an H4 heading, a paragraph to it. We also add some lorem epsom text placeholder to the P element. I add uh, two more uh, P element here. One more. I saved the file. And then let's, let's look at it on the screen. Okay. It looks good. And we also add the footer element, which uh, contains two div elements. The first div is for copyright. We give it a class attribute and use an HTML character entity for copyright. We will talk about the HTML character entities later. I do some copy and paste over here. This is the 
character entity we use here for uh, copyright. We add the second div. Uh, again, I do some copy and paste here. This is the second div. Uh, uh, it has a, an A element in it with the uh, href uh, with value of a hashtag and the class attribute uh, and the description back to top. And let's uh, save our file and take a look at it. So here they are, the copyright and back to the top. If I click on this link, it goes all the way to the top like this. We know uh, browsers work hard to display our page in a human readable format and use a minimal set of styles to do so. We can style and design the look of our page exactly how we want it by adding a CSS style sheet to our page. As I mentioned earlier, there are different ways to apply a style sheet to our page. We know uh, one way is to use the link element and add it as an external file to our page. I have prepared a style sheet in a file uh, style.css and add it over here. Let's add it to our file. I saved the file. Here it is. So we have the H1 element here, the navigation bar with the links, the image, the button. the copyright, and back to the top. Next page is uh, test your knowledge. Please keep in mind, practice and repetition foster learning. Let's move on to the next HTML topic, which is lists. A list is a collection of related items that specifies a list of information. I have already made a folder named folder-04 and added an index.html file to it. I type an exclamation mark and press the tab key. Then uh, we start with a header element contains an H1 element. When the order of the items is not important, we use an ordered list. To make an ordered list, we use the UL element and we nest line item elements inside of it with uh, LI elements. I am adding uh, an H3 element here and copy and pasting some text.
We use UL element and we nest a line item elements inside of it with LI elements like this. I give the first one description of and I copy and paste this two more times and the second one we make it uh, let's say fruits And the third one, how about the ice cream? Let's save the file and see it on the screen. This is our H1 element inside the header and this is our, our an ordered list. It is usually presented as a bulleted list, like so. The default bullet type is a disk shape. If you want to change it or remove it, use the CSS list style type property to modify it. If the order of items is important, we make ordered list. Making ordered list is the same as for an ordered list, except that instead of UL element, we use OL element. I am adding an H4 element here and copying and pasting some text again. We use a uh, OL element and the nest uh, line items elements inside of it uh, with a lie. Um, let's call the, this one the first item. And uh, again, I uh, copy and I copy this like this and I change this one to second and this one to the third. Let's uh, save the file and see it on the screen. This is our ordered list. You can set the value of an ordered list to a starting number using the value attribute. Again, I am adding an H4 element here and copying and pasting some text. I am also copying this order list over here and adding two more line items to it. I call this one the fourth item. And this one, the fifth item. As I mentioned, you can set the value of an ordered list to a starting number using the value attribute, like uh,
like this, which uh, makes the list to begin with the number five. Uh, let's save the file. Here it is. The starting number is the number five, six, seven, eight, and so on. If the second item's value is nine, what happened? Let's see. And uh, I save the file again. Here it is. The first one stays at number five. We gave the second one uh, the number nine, and it started with uh, nine, 10, 11, and so on. What will happen if the third item's value is 27? Let's give it a try. I save the file. Here it is. This is how uh, the value attribute works with the list items. You may nest one list inside another one. The UL and OL elements can be nested as deeply as we want. The nested list may alternate between OL and UL without restriction. I am adding another H4 element here and copying and pasting some text one more time. We begin with an, an ordered list with three items. Let's call the first one apples. And then uh, the second one, the, let's do uh, berries. And the third one, uh, oranges. Uh, let's save our file. Here they are. But uh, apples come in uh, different types. We can uh, actually uh, add some uh, apple types over here. So we do it like this. And let's say uh, the first one is red, red apple, red delicious apple. And then uh, the second one, let's say is golden. And the third one, uh, Granny Smith, that's delicious too. And uh, there are more, but we don't want our list to get too long. So we just leave one over here when we call it others. Okay, uh, let's uh, save our file. So here it is. We just uh, nested uh, this uh, list inside our apples. 
And then uh, berries also are um, different types. So we can do one more for berries. This time, uh, let's do it a kind of, uh, let's do it a, an uh, ordered list. Okay, so uh, like this, we say OL. And let's call the first one. Uh, I like blueberries actually, so I do the first one blueberries. And then uh, I copy this two times and I just change the second one to raspberry. and the last one to strawberry. Like this. Okay, let's uh, save our file. Here it is. So uh, we nested uh, an ordered list over here. The first item is blueberries, second raspberry, and third strawberry. Nice. As I said earlier, the UL and the OL elements can be nested as deeply as we want. Uh, let's add uh, more apples here. We can do it as an, an ordered or ordered list. I do it as an, an ordered list. You can do it however you like. Okay, let's do the first one. I call it a Fuji. And the second one, let's uh, have a Gala. And the third one, let's make it in Macintosh. And let's save our file. Here they are. So we nested another one inside this one. So we have already this one, one list. This is the second one, and this is the third one. Let's also add the footer element uh, to our file. It is a uh, contains uh, two div elements. You saw it before, and uh, one for copyright, another one for uh, back to top. I do some copy and paste over here. Here uh, they are. Uh, the first div, uh, as uh, we know, it's for the copyright, and the second one is back to top. The link. Okay, let's save our file. Here they are. So this is our page. I have also prepared the basic style sheet in the file style.css and added the here again. And we added to our file that I saved the file. Here it is. This is our page. The next screen is the 
test your knowledge and contains an important side notes. Please don't miss it. I mentioned the links and a few examples of their use earlier. Let's talk more about them. Hyperlinks have been around since the beginning of the web. They are used to link to other pages of the same website as well as uh, to other websites. You can link a specific part of a document. Almost any web content can be linked. And when the link is clicked, the browser displays the destination of the link. I have already created another folder and named it folder-05. And inside it, I have an empty index.html file. I type an exclamation mark and press the tab key. Let's make a simple website. When you create a multiple page website, you need a navigation menu to link some pages together. Let's make a header with a navigation menu. We begin with a header element, add an H1 element, a nav element, and 5A element in it. We give the nav element a class attribute with the value of navbar. A basic link is created by nesting the text or other content inside an A or anchor element and using the href attribute. We know href stands for hypertext reference or target that contains the destination address. We add five links inside of our navbar This is our main page. The first one is uh, our about page. I copy this uh, four more times. Let's uh, change the second one to uh, HTML5 page. And then uh, the third one uh, to CSS. And the file name also, we make it CSS. And the fourth one, uh, JavaScript.
and we change the file name to JS. And uh, we make the last one our contact page. And we also name it contact.html. Uh, let's add these pages and make a navigation menu for them. We can use the same structure on every page, including the same uh, navigation menu to give the impression that we are on the same page when a link is clicked. Simply uh, remove the link to the same page and replace it with the link to the home page at the top of the navigation menu. Let's make the about page and give it a navigation menu. We add another file to our folder. If we call it about.html. We make sure to add it to the same folder. I type an exclamation mark and press the tab key. This is our about.html file. I uh, copy the header from index.html and uh, paste it over here. Let's uh, change the header to about page. We know each page must not have its own page link in the navigation menu. We replace it with the link to the home page at the top of the navigation menu. The about uh, page is at the top already, so I'll just change it to home page. We know the file for our homepage is index.html. Let's save this file. And then we add the, the next page, which is HTML5. Again, we add another file to our folder. And this one, we call it HTML. 5.html again the same thing this time I copy the header from the about page and add it over here so again if we know uh, the page must not have its own link. So I'm going to change this one to the, the about dot, the about page is missing over here. So I'm going to change this to about page. And don't forget about the file name. So change it to about dot HTML. So we have the home page at the top about the second CSS. We don't have HTML5 over here, which is we shouldn't. Uh, let's uh, save this one. And then we make the next one. Again, I copy this one. We make uh, another file and we call it the CSS.html. We do the same thing again and paste over here. And this time uh, we change the CSS to HTML5.
Okay, and then uh, we save it. Again, copy this one. We add another file. We call it js.html. This is for our JavaScript. We do the same thing again. And we paste it here. This time we change the JavaScript to CSS page. And again, we save it. One more time, we copy this. And we create our contact page. We do the same thing. And we paste it over here. And we change our contact to the one is missing, which is JavaScript. And again, we make sure to change the file name. Here it is, we save it. Okay, let's go back to our index file we save that and then uh, let's take a look at it here it is this is our uh, h1 element heading and uh, since this is the index.html file uh, the first one is about page if i click on it We have the about page, then start with the home page and go on. The next one, HTML, the next one, CSS, the next one, JavaScript, and the contact page. We go back to the home page. This is our uh, simple uh, nav bar. I will pause the recording, uh, copy and paste uh, the content for each page to make things go faster and then be back. I am done adding content for each page. Let's try them to make sure they are working. I just added uh, the, some text to each page like this that's the HTML and then this is the CSS this is the JavaScript and the contact uh, page is empty now we could add a contact form to it when we learn how to do forms uh, we will do it later A URL which uh, stands for Universal Resource Locator is a, a string of text that states where something is located on the web. For example, the World Wide Web Consortium, aka W3C, website is located at uh, located at this address. Let's add a link for it to our page. We start with a section. We know uh, a section element uh, should have a heading. So we give it um, an H2 heading. And we call, we give it the description of hyperlinks.
We add a P element, give it a class attribute for our future use, and nest our link inside it. I do some uh, copy and paste here. This is the class attribute with the value of uh, W3C-1. This is some text over here, and this is our link uh, with uh, we are using uh, an A element, and the uh, strip has the link to w3o.org, uh, and also it has a target attribute uh, with the value of the underscore blank. Uh, we want to open uh, the link in a new page. Uh, let's uh, save it and uh, look at it on the screen. This is our home page. Here it is. As you can see, this part of the text is only hyperlinked because it is within the A element, while uh, these parts are outside of it. And here is the link. Let's click on it to make sure it works. Yep. A URL can point to HTML files, images, video files, or anything else that exists on the web. As you know, the home page of a typical website may contain many links that point to different areas of the site and other websites. You can also add the title attribute to a link. The title attribute contains additional information about the link. For example, again, we add a P element give it a class for our future use and nest our link inside it. I do some copy and paste again here. The P element has a class attribute and some text over here. The A element, uh, the href attribute uh, of the A element has uh, the value of the Google main page address, and the A element also has a target attribute uh, with the value of uh, underscore blank. Uh, again, because we want them, we want to open it in a new window, and then uh, the title attribute uh, has this text as uh, its a description. Let's uh, save it and uh, look at it on the screen. Here it is. Hover over it. You see the description. There is a caveat. Uh, the link title is only displayed on a mouse hover. People who use uh, keyboards or uh, touch screens may have difficulty accessing it. Uh, let's talk about absolute and relative uh, URL. On the web, links are referred to using two different terms, absolute URL and relative URL. An absolute URL is one that uh, points to a, a specific location on the internet. It is commonly used to access a page that is not hosted on the web server where your website is hosted. Assume uh, the landing page of a website is called landing page.html. This landing page's uh, absolute URL would be
like this. You have the protocol, the domain name, the folder or directory, and the file name, landing-page.html. If no file is uh, specified in the URL, it uh, will look like uh, this. because most uh, web uh, servers load the default landing page, such as index.html. These uh, URLs uh, point to the absolute location of the index.html file. If you don't uh, want index.html to be uh, the landing page, you must add the landing page name to the URL uh, like this, like over here. A relative URL points to a location that is relative to the file you are linking from. You can use them to reference links on the same computer or server that contains the file. A relative URL will point to different places depending on the actual location of the file you refer to. Relative URLs could have different paths. If the file is in the same uh, folder, the URL is as simple as the file name, such as uh, if the file is in a subdirectory, for example, asset subdirectory, the URL could be like this. If the file is in a higher uh, directory, like uh, the main directory, we use uh, double dots, which means to go up one directory. The URL could be like this. Next is block level links. As I said earlier, any content can be made into a link, even a block level elements. Let's add an image and link it to a website. You know, the image element is a void or empty element. So we use the figure element. And if we want to add a caption, we use the fig caption element. We begin with the figure element, add a link to W3C page, and attach it to an image like this. I do some copy and paste here. This is the figure element. The first element inside the figure element is the A element. The href attribute has uh, the address to w3.org website. The element also has the target attribute with the value of the underscore blank. We nested the image inside the element. This is the start tag of the element and this is the end tag of the element. The image has uh, the class attribute, and this is the image we are going to use. I added here.
Our image also has the alt attribute, and this is the description of it. We gave the image uh, the width of uh, 350 pixel and the height of 220 pixels. And then uh, we add uh, the feed caption after the end tag of the A element. We want it to be appear at the bottom of our image. Let's save the file and give it a try. Here is the image. I click on it. It works fine. This is the W3 page. Next, we begin with an article element. An article should have a heading too. We add an H2 heading, a few P elements, and a block code element to it. I do some uh, copy and paste here. I am uh, pasting the content for this article. So uh, we added an article uh, element. It has H2 heading and several uh, P element, like so. And then some of them have as a class attribute. And this is our block code element over here. And then we have a link at the bottom of it, the article. The block code element uh, specifies that the text within is an extended uh, quotation. Indentation is uh, commonly used to uh, represent it uh, visually. Let's uh, save our file and uh, take a look at it on the screen. Here it is the article element, and this is the heading for it. Has a few uh, paragraph. This is the paragraph inside the block code element. It is uh, indented uh, to represent it visually. And here uh, we have another link to W3C website. Uh, let's add a footer and place three div elements and two links uh, in it. I do some uh, copy and paste here again. This is our footer. The first div is for the email link. You can use a URL like mail to colon example at gmail.com like this. To create links or buttons that, when clicked, open a new outgoing email message, where uh, example at gmail.com is the recipient email address. 
The recipient's email address is optional. If you omit it, the href mail to link will open a new outgoing message with no destination email address. This is the same as share links that allow users to share contents and send an email to an address of their choice. The second div is uh, the copyright div. Uh, we have seen it before. And the last one is uh, a link uh, for uh, back to top. Let's save the file and see it on the screen. Here they are. This is the email link. And this is back to top. You can also link to a specific parts of a text in an HTML document. It is known as text fragments. And to do so, you add a hashtag, a colon, a tilde, and another colon to the end of the URL, followed by the word text, an equal sign, and a text a string where the text string is the word or phrase that you want the link to stop on and highlight. The text fragments link will highlight and stop on the first matched phrase. This also allows you to link to another content that you don't control like other websites. For more information, search online for MDN WebDocs text fragments, like what I'm doing now. It is the first option for me. If you click on this link, you get more information about text fragments. Let's see how it works. We added uh, near the top of uh, our page. I think it's good here. As I said, we add a hashtag, a colon, a tilde, and another colon to the end of uh, the URL followed by the word text, an equal sign, and a text string where the text string is uh, the word or phrase that you want the link to uh, stop on and highlight. We begin with a P element, give it a class attribute, and uh, add three A elements in it. I do some uh, copy and paste here. The first uh, A element over here, the href uh, has uh, my local host uh, folder dash 05 uh, index.html file. 
this is the end of the URL. I added the hashtag colon tilde another colon text and equal sign founded in 1994. This is the text string. In my case, I want the link stop on founded in 1994 and highlighted. And this is the description for our uh, A element. Uh, I save the file and uh, we try it. Here is the link. I expand this and I click on the link. Here it is. It uh, stops on uh, the first uh, matching uh, phrase and highlight it. Make sure this uh, URL is the same as the one over here. Otherwise, uh, it won't work and you will get an error. As I mentioned, uh, we can do the same thing for a document in the web that we don't control, like other websites. Uh, let's uh, try that too. Uh, I'm going to add another link over here. I, I do some uh, copy and paste again. This is the second uh, A element. The tree has a URL to the page of uh, W3C. And this is the end of uh, URL. Again, I added the same thing. This is the text uh, string. Uh, we want the link stop on it. Invented the World Wide Web in 1989. The A element has a, the target attribute uh, with underscore blank if we want it to open in a new window. And this is the description. I save the file and uh, we give it a try again. This is the link. I am expanding this and I click on this link. Here it is. This is a page of a W3C uh, website. And this is the phrase. Uh, is uh, The link is top on it and is highlighted. We can do the same thing on a page of our website. Uh, we do it on our uh, CSS.html page. I do some copy and paste over here again. This is the third uh, A element. Uh, the href has a URL to my local host, uh, the same folder, file css.html. This is the end of the URL. Again, I did the same thing and the text equal sign and the decorative features is the phrase we want the link stop on and highlight. It has a target attribute again because we want them to open it in a new window and this is the description. I save the file and uh, we try it out. Uh, let me expand this again and this is our link over here. Here it is, a CSS page, our CSS page and this is the phrase. Uh, the link is top on it and highlighted. I have a prepared a basic style sheet in the file style.css. Here is the file. I am going to add it to our file right now.
Okay, and I save the file. Here it is. Let me expand this again. This is uh, our website. Uh, the header uh, contains the title and the navigation bar, which contains uh, links. As you can see, I have also added the style.css and footer for each page to give the impression that uh, we are on the same page when a link is uh, clicked. Yeah, this is another one and this is the JavaScript page and this is the contact page. Uh, as I said earlier, we can add a contact form to our contact page when we learn how to make forms later on. This is the paragraph in the blog code element. The browser indented it to indicate this is a code from another uh, source. And over here in the footer, we have the copyright back to the top and also the email link over here. The test your uh, knowledge screen is the following one. The content that I have added to the pages is just an example. Feel free to include any type of content on the project's uh, pages, like images, uh, link, uh, and other things. Text formatting elements. Let's talk about some elements that you may want to use for text formatting. I have already uh, created a folder and named it uh, folder-06 and add an empty index.html file to it. I type an exclamation mark and press the tab key. We begin with an article, an H1, and a P element. Rather than typing everything and boring you, to speed things up, I will copy and paste as needed. The H1 element is the title of our uh, web page. The, and this paragraph has some text about MDN web docs. One of the elements that you may need to use for text formatting is uh, quotation marks. As you know, quotation marks are reserved characters in HTML documents and are used to reference attributes. We cannot use them for quotations. Instead, we can use the block code element for a block quotation as you have seen it before. Here, uh, I use the block code element and add another H4 heading, some texts, and an A element inside of it like this. I do some copy and paste here. We have a, a block code element, a H4 inside of it, and there is a paragraph here. A, Inside the paragraph, we have uh, an A element. 
the A element H Reef has a URL to a MDN website and also has a, the target attribute with the value of a underscore blank. Let's save the file and uh, look at it on the screen. This is the title of our web page. This is the H1 element. And this is the first paragraph about the MDN web docs. And this is the blog code element. The browser indented it like this. We can also use the Q element for inline quotation, for example. Again, I add an H4 element here, followed by a P element that contains some texts. I do some uh, copy and paste here. This is the H4 element, has class attribute, the first paragraph, and this is the Q element. The Q element has a class attribute and also has a style attribute uh, because we want the uh, font uh, be printed in bold. This is our A element, the A element H Reef has this URL and also has the target attribute with the value of uh, underscore blank. And uh, also we have this paragraph over here. I uh, save the file and we look at it on the screen. Here it is. Uh, uh, this is the H4 uh, element this is the paragraph and this is the q element as you can see the browser wrapped it inside the quotation marks next uh, we want to talk about the details and the summary elements the details element generates a revealing a widget which only display information when the widget is toggled to the open position. The summary element must contain a summary or label for the information that is to be revealed. I use a div element as a container and add a details element inside of it and nest a summary element inside the details element. I do some copy and paste here. This is the details element. The summary element is nested inside it. This is the information uh, the detail element uh, is going to uh, reveal. I add this uh, paragraph over here to have some content uh, on our page. I save the file and uh, we look at it on the screen. This is our details and uh, summary elements. The widget is usually represented by a small triangular that rotates to indicate open or closed position and the contents of the summary element are used as the label for it. This is the content of the summary element. And if I click on the this little uh, triangle, it rotates and we will see this text 
right here. Here it is. This is the text. And if I click on it again, it hides the text again. Here it is. This is how uh, details and the summary elements work. Next, uh, we talk about the aside element. The aside element represents a section of a page that contains content that is slightly related to but different from the content surrounding the aside element. And some examples are a key phrase, quotation, advertising, or sidebars. I add uh, an aside element I'm going to do some uh, copying and pasting here. This is our aside element, uh, the H4 has a class attribute and uh, a paragraph with uh, some text in it. I also add this paragraph over here to have uh, some content on our page. Uh, I am going to save the file and we look at it on the screen. This is the aside element. The browser default style uh, displays it like this. And these are the other two paragraphs which I added over here. Let's talk about the character entities. Browsers will parse reserved characters in HTML like uh, ampersand, less than, or greater than sign, and the quotation marks uh, as uh, HTML code. When you want to display these characters as a text, you must replace them with the matching character entities. I comment this for your uh, reference. An HTML character entity name is a text or a string that starts with ampersand and ends with a semicolon, like copyright symbol or noun breaking a space. An HTML character entity number is a number start with ampersand and hashtag and end with a semicolon like a copyright symbol or noun breaking a space i add a, a div over here uh, as a container again with the h4 element and uh, some example like this I'm copying and uh, pasting. So we have a div element as a container, h4 heading with a class attribute. And these are the examples. I, I save the file and uh, we look at them on the screen.
Here they are. Browsers uh, support uh, entity numbers better than uh, entity names. Um, try to use entity numbers uh, where you can. You can search online for the list of HTML character entities. Next, uh, we talk about the superscript and subscript elements. You may need to use a superscript and subscript elements when uh, marking up items like dates, chemical formula, and uh, math equations so they have correct form and uh, meaning. I use another uh, div element as a container and uh, some example uh, in it. I do some uh, copy and paste again here. So we have a, a div element. It has a class attribute and uh, there is a p element inside of it for a superscript element. These are the examples. And then we have another p element over here. It has a class attribute also for, uh, and uh, this p element is for a subscript element. And these are the example of it. Uh, I save the file and we look at them on the screen. Here they are. This is the superscript element like this uh, and then uh, th this is a birthday and then you have we have a uh, subscript elements here with some uh, chemical uh, formula superscript text appears uh, half a character above the normal line and it is uh, sometimes uh, rendered in a smaller font. Subscript text appears a half a character below the normal line and uh, is sometimes rendered in a smaller font too. Next, we talk about the pre-element. The pre-element uh, retains white space and indentation. If you wrap the text within a pre-tags, it will be rendered the same as what it shows on your text uh, editor. It is uh, useful for uh, some text block like a poem, for example, We add a p element over here. And we give it the class attribute. Like this. I do some copy and paste here. We add the pre-element over here. And I do some uh, copy and paste again. I save the file uh, to see it on the screen. Here it is. As you can see, uh, the poem is the same as over here. Uh, the pre-element uh, uh, retains uh, white space and uh, indentation. 
The next element is uh, the mark element. It represents a text which is uh, marked or highlighted for reference or notation purposes. As we used it earlier, I am going to do some copy and paste here again. We have a P element over here uh, with the class attribute and we nested the mark element inside the P element. I save the file uh, to see it on the screen. And here it is. The last element is the address element. Only contact information can be represented by the address element. This element should not include any information other than the contact information and may include any type of contact information that is required. I am using a div element here. I do a copy and paste again. Uh, we, again, we have a div element, it has a class attribute, and then we have a paragraph inside it. The, the paragraph has a class attribute also. And then we have the address element over here. Inside the address element, we have a link for a mail to about which we talked previously. And also we have a click to call a link. The A element has a chief attribute with the value of tel colon along with the phone number we want to be called at. We enter the phone number the way I have done it without any dashes. And also you can add the phone number or a description over here. When the link is clicked, it dials the number. Cellular devices auto dial the number. Most operating systems have programs that can make calls like Skype or FaceTime. As you have seen, we have an email address, we have phone number, and also we have an address inside the address element. I save the file and then we look at it on the screen. Here it is. I have also prepared the basic uh, style sheet in uh, style.css file. The file is here. I am going to add it to our file. I save the file and here it is. Let me expand this. This is the heading, the head one element. This is the first paragraph. This is the block code element. This is the inline uh, quotation. This is the details and the summary uh, elements. I click on it. Here it is. I click on it. This is uh, the aside element with a little uh, style. It becomes like this, which is uh, more presentable than the one uh, we saw earlier. 
Then uh, we have the character entities, superscript elements, subscript element. This is the pre-element, this is the poem. The mark element, then we have our address element over here. If I click on this number, it says make a call from, I don't have any app, so I'm gonna be like this, just. The test your knowledge is the next screen. As I mentioned before, to learn a programming language, practice is key. The more you practice, the better you get. It is also important to remember the concept of the code and how it works. Please complete all of them. Watch the video again and repeat them if needed until you are comfortable with them. How to apply CSS and JavaScript to an HTML file? Almost all websites use cascading style sheets, aka CSS, to make them look cool, and JavaScript to make them interactive and functional. One way to apply them to an HTML file is by using link and script elements. The link and script elements uh, should go in the head element. I have already created a folder, named it folder-07 and add an index.html file to it. The index.html contains an H1 heading, three paragraphs, and the footer. Let's take a look at it on the screen. Here it is. This is the title of the page, the H1 element, three paragraphs, and the footer. We use this page for this uh, video. ESS is applied to a web page using the style elements, links, and style attributes. The style element must be included inside the head element of the page, like this. I do some copy and paste here. This is uh, the style element right here. It contains this uh, CSS rule. We want uh, to style our H1 heading element. We want to change the font to italic, center it on the page, and change its color to this nice blue. I save the file to see the changes on the screen. Here it is. It is a best practice to put your styles in an external file and apply them using link elements. 
I prepared a simple uh, style sheet in file uh, style.css and added over here. We are going to use it for uh, this file. I am going to comment this out for your reference. Then uh, we add the link element here. You have seen this before. I have uh, done it for uh, almost all the videos. And the uh, file is the style dot CSS. The link element should always go inside the head element. This takes uh, two attributes. The REL attribute, the value is a style sheet, which indicates that it is the style sheet document. And the href, which uh, contains the path to the style sheet file. In my case, since I have the style.css file in the same uh, folder, I just add the file name over here. The REL attribute defines the relationship between a linked resource and the current document. I save the file to see the changes on the screen. Here is our page. You can add a favicon to your page using a link element. Save your icon image into main directory or the same directory as the index.html file. Add the following link into the head element to reference it. Since this is an icon, the value for uh, REL attribute uh, is icon. My image is in the main directory. So in my case, I have to go up one directory. It's going to be like this. This is my favicon. And also, uh, we add a type attribute here. Like this. Favicon usually appears over here. The style attribute can be added directly to a single HTML element. This is called inline styling. Inline style takes a priority over a CSS included before it. If you include multiple style and link elements in your document, they will be applied in the order they are included in the document. For example, uh, let's uh, change the H1 element color. The value for the style attribute uh, should come like this, uh, color colon space green semicolon. I save the file uh, to see the changes. Here it is. The green color uh, takes priority over the red color because it is applied later. We apply it after this, it's right here. I am going to comment this out for your reference. Before I do that, I copy it first. And uh, I comment this one. 
and uh, delete uh, the style for this one. Save the file. The color change. The H1 has a, a red color now. There are different ways to load JavaScript on your page. JavaScript is applied to an HTML file using script elements. It can be done internally or using an external file. To add JS internally, you add a script element to the head element before the head element closing tab. You can also add it in the body element or in both for any number of scripts. To add your uh, JS code within the script tags in the head element, you do it like this. I just do uh, this simple code here for a demonstration. I do some copy and paste. The code states uh, x equals 2 times 25. If y equals x minus 10, alert or display, y is the correct number. Otherwise, prompt, enter the correct number. I save the file to see it on the screen. Here it is. 40 is the correct number. I expand this, refresh the page again. Here it is again, 40 is the correct number. I comment this uh, for your reference. You can also add it in the body element or in both for any number of scripts, like here. Again, I have uh, another silly code. Uh, I am going mm, to copy and paste it over here. Uh, this code, it says, uh, the state that uh, A equals 10, if A greater than 11, alert or display, hello, Michael. Otherwise, uh, alert, uh, how are you all doing? Let's uh, save the file and uh, see it on the screen. Here it is. How are you all doing? Yay. So the code is working. I am going to comment it out for your reference. To add a JavaScript externally in the same folder as your HTML file, Create a file with the file name extension .js, for example, index.js, and add your code to the file. The most reliable way to use it for modern browsers is to add a script element to the head element for your page like this. Make sure to add the defer attribute over here. As I mentioned uh, earlier, 
We know the HTML on a page is loaded in the order in which it appears. If you are using a JavaScript to manipulate elements on the page, your code won't work if the JavaScript is loaded and parsed before the HTML body is parsed. The defer attribute here tells the browser to continue downloading the HTML content and the script is executed when the page has been parsed and the code will work. I comment this out uh, for your reference. And old-fashioned solution to this problem used to be to put your script element right at the bottom of the body element. This is supposed to be uh, here just before the body element intact. And it uh, would uh, load uh, after the entire HTML had been parsed. The problem with this uh, solution is that loading and parsing of the script are uh, completely blocked until the HTML DOM has been loaded. On large sites with lots of JavaScript, this can cause a major performance issue, slowing down your site. I comment this out for your reference. The next screen is the test your knowledge screen. HTML tables present organized information or data which is typically displayed in rows and columns for tabular data. Tables are frequently used in research, data analysis, report writing, and other applications. I have already created a folder named it folder-08, add an empty index.html file to it. I type an exclamation mark and press the tab key. We start with an h2 element, give it a class attribute. To mark up a table, we use the table element and then we add the caption element to it. I do some uh, copy and paste here. The caption element, similar to a title, provides information that can help users. The caption element is not required in all cases. 
Next, uh, we add the table head element below the caption element. Then we add the table row element within the table head element. TR element defines a row of cells in a table. This is our uh, row element. We add uh, our table uh, header cells inside this TR element. The TH element defines a cell as the header of a group of table cells. The scoop attribute with the value col defines the header cells as column headers and it can be used by screen readers. I will copy this uh, three times and I make the changes like this. Next, uh, we add the table body element just below the table head element. We add a TR element here and nest our table data cell element into it like this. The TD element defines a cell in a table that contains data. I copy this uh, three more times. And I make the changes like this. I save the file uh, to uh, display it on the screen. This is the H2 uh, heading. This is the caption. This is the uh, column headers, and this is the first row of our table. I am going to uh, copy uh, and paste them three more times. I save the file. Here we are. Uh, we have a, a table with four rows over here. 
Now we add the table foot element here, which defines a set of rows uh, summarizing the columns of the table. And also we add the a TR and the TD elements with the table foot element description to it. We save the file to see it on a screen. Here it is, uh, the table foot element right here. I expand uh, this. Tables aren't meant to be used for layout purposes. Instead, a best practice is to use cascading style sheets for a visual presentation. I have already created a style.css file. Uh, let's apply it to our table. Uh, this is the file. I save the file and I expand this. Here is our table. Much better. Next, uh, let's uh, talk about the row span and call span attributes. Most browsers' default settings automatically resize uh, the row and columns in a table to fit the contents, like this. If I close this, again, you see. However, if we want to span a row's height, we use the row span attribute. The default value is one for one cell. To span the height of a row for a desired height, you give it the desired value. We want the first cell of the first row to be two cells tall, and this one. This is uh, our first row, and this is the first cell. And if we give it the two for value, I save the file. And let's expand this. So we change the height of the first cell, but it pushed this row to the right. And now we have the fourth cell over here. We don't want it to be over here. So in order to fix it, we must delete the first cell of the second row, this one. I am not going to delete it. I commented out for your reference. And I save the file. So now it is fixed. We use the call span attribute to span the width of a column. The default value is one for one cell. To span the width of a column for a desired width, you give it the desired value. We want the first column of the fourth row to be two cells wide, this one.
This is the fourth row and this is the first cell. Again, we give it two for a value here also. I save the file. We have the same problem over here. We change the weather of this one and it pushed the row to the right. So we need to fix it to get rid of this. We have to delete this uh, cell, the fourth cell. Uh, to fix it, I am not going to delete it again, and I just uh, commented out for your reference. Save the file. Here it is. It is fixed. We need to do one more thing. Our table has four columns but the food element is just showing one column. We need uh, to fix that in order to stretch it all the way. In order to do that, we add a call span over here, and we give it the value, a value of four. Save the file, expand this, here it is. Now the food element is the way it's supposed to be. I have already created a table that includes the top row and offset column of uh, header cells and caption element. I will copy and paste it and then we will go over the details. Let's uh, expand this. Here it is the table. We have a H2 element uh, over here and uh, this is the heading for uh, this table. And this is the caption element uh, over here. It's kind of a sort of title for the table. This is the top row header. The row header cells are in the second rather than in the first column. And we have the table foot here. Let's go take a look at the code. This is uh, the H2 element over here, and this is the description of it. Then we start with the table element, and then caption with the caption description over here. Then below the caption element, we have table head element. Uh, we gave the top row header cells uh, the scoop attribute and set its value to col to assign them as the headers for our column. We also have over here an abbreviation element. The abbreviation element has a title attribute. Its value is identification number and the description of ID. If I hover over the description, you can see the identification number. As I said, the row header cells are in the second uh, column. We assign the header cells in the second column to the data cells on the left and the right, the left and the right uh, of each uh, header by using the scoop attribute and setting its value to row. This is the first row, the second, the third, 
And we did the same thing for all of them, as you can see. And then we have the uh, table foot over here. It has a table row. And inside the table uh, row, we have uh, the table header uh, cell. Uh, we use the call span and uh, with the value of two for uh, total. Uh, this, the description is total over here. And then uh, the table data also, we gave it the call span with the value of four and the description is the grand total number over here. Uh, on the last uh, uh, row of our table, uh, we have the gave the table the uh, header uh, a scoop row and then uh, call a span uh, with the value two and the description weekly total is over here, right here. So this is uh, our second table. Here it is. The next uh, screen is the test your knowledge screen. Web forms are one of the most common ways for a user to interact with a website or application. They are used to collect information from users or to provide them with user interface control, such as logging in, registering, adding items to a list, or commenting. HTML forms are made of one or more form controls and some other elements to help structure the form. The controls, which can be buttons, single or multi-line text fields, checkboxes, radio buttons, or drop-down boxes are often made using the input element. However, there are a few additional elements to learn about as well. I created a folder, named it folder-09, and add an empty index.html file to it. I type an exclamation mark and press the tab key. Let's make a simple contact form. The form will have three text fields, one phone field and one button. The fields are name, email, mobile and message. The user hits the button to send the message to a server. We start uh, with an H2 and a span element. I do some uh, copy and paste here. Every time you want to create an HTML form, you must begin with the form element and then nest all of the contents inside. To structure a web form, you can use all of HTML's power. There are optional attributes that can be used to configure how a form behaves but setting at least the action and method attributes is a standard practice. The action attribute specifies the URL where the form's collected data should be sent when it is submitted. We do some uh, copy and paste here. We set the value of our form action attribute to this URL. 
It is an open source uh, HTTP request and response service. You can search online for HTTP BIN, like what I'm doing, it is the first option. If you click on it, you get more information about this website, this one. We also add the, the method attribute. The method attribute specifies the HTTP method that will be used to send data. We set it to post, which will post our data to this website. And we set the target attribute to underscore blank. We use an, an ordered list to structure the form. Each list item uh, contains a label and input elements. It is common practice to wrap a label and its widget with a li element within a list. p and div elements are also commonly used. We add the label element and give the for attribute the value of name and the description of name and an asterisk. Like this. The first input is a single line text field that accepts any kind of text input. The default value for type attribute is text. User enter their names in this field we also give it a class for future use and make it a required field. And also we give it the ID attribute with the value of name. And name attribute also with the value of user underscore name. And class attribute, uh, we set it to input dash with. I like this. And also we make it required. We save the file and uh, see it on the screen. Here it is. This is our H2 element. This is the span element. And this is our first field. Therefore, an ID attributes are used 
to associate each form control with its label to make usability and accessibility easier for a variety of devices and screen readers. As you can see, they have the same value. We do almost the same things for email. We gave the value uh, of uh, email for the for attribute. And then uh, we set the description to And also, uh, we add an asterisk to make it required. The second uh, input is also a single line text field that accepts an email address in text format. The default value for the type attribute is email. This turns a regular text field into a field that checks the data to have an email address format. Again, we give it the ID attribute. And then uh, we call it uh, actually, we give it the value of email. The same as the for attribute over here. And then uh, name attribute, uh, we set it to user underscore email. And we give it a class attribute with the same value of uh, input dash with. And we make it required, like so. I save it uh, to see it on the screen. Here it is. This is our uh, email field. And next, uh, we add the third field. The label is for phone and has a mobile description. but we don't make it required. The third uh, input is also a single line text field that has been formatted to accept a basic phone number. The default value for the type uh, attribute is tell. We have uh, added a placeholder and pattern attributes for formatting it. As I said, uh, we don't make it uh, a required field. We add a name attribute again. And then we give it the user underscore mobile. And also we give it ID attribute with the, the same uh, value on. And uh, we also add a placeholder. attribute and then we give it a format like this mm -hmm. 
then uh, we add uh, a pattern attribute I copy and paste here And also we add uh, a class attribute, the same value. The pattern, the first part means three digits and must be from zero to nine. And the second three digits also the second three digit must be from zero to nine and also the last four digit must be from zero to nine we save it to see it on the screen here it is And next, uh, we add a checkbox below the phone and ask the user to check the box to opt in for text messaging. The default value for the type uh, attribute is checkbox. We want the checkbox to appear to the left of the text. To do that, we nest the input element inside the label element, like this. And the type is a checkbox. We give it name attribute with the value of underscore texting. Also, we give it the ID attribute with the same value of texting. And then we add the text here. I do some copy and paste here. And let's uh, save it and uh, see it on the screen. Here it is. We have the box to the left of the text. We continue with the message field. We use a text area element and make it required. This is a multiple line text field with editing features that is good for users, reviews, comments, messages, or feedback. We give it the value of MSG like this, and then uh, we make it required. The name attribute, we set it to uh, user underscore message. 
and uh, we give the ID attribute uh, the same value SMG. I am going to get rid of the this columns and row over here. We don't need it. But uh, I make it required. Let's uh, save it and see it on the screen. Here it is. This is the text area. The last uh, list item is a button element, which allows the users to click on it and send their data to the web server included in the form's uh, action attribute right here. We did this one. Send it to this one. For our simple form, the button type is a submit. And we give it the, the description of send your message like this. Let's save it and see it on the screen. Here is our thought. If I click on it, uh, it's going to ask uh, to fill these fields because they are required like this. See? It's a Please fill out this one. Okay. Sending form data to a server. Both on the client and server sides, names are crucial because they tell the browser which name to give each piece of data. And on the server side, they instruct the server to handle each piece of data by name. The form data is sent to the server as name value pairs. In order to name the data in a form, you must use the name attribute. We used for all of them, if you remember. We used name attribute for all of them. As I said, uh, we have uh, to use a name attribute on each form control that will gather a certain piece of data. In our example, the form will submit five pieces of data named user underscore name right here user underscore email over here and user underscore mobile and allow underscore texting for the checkbox and we have user underscore message for our message and text area box the http post method will be used to send the data to the URL, this one, and this is the method, and we gave it the value of post. On the server side, the script at the URL will receive the data as a list of five key value items contained in the HTTP request. You direct how the script handles the data. For example, uh, display it, which is in our case, we ask to be displayed, store it in a database, sends it uh, by email, or process it in some other way.
for managing form data, each server side language has its own uh, mechanism. We have finished the coding of our contact form. It currently does not appear uh, promising. As you can see, to make it uh, look okay, uh, we apply some CSS styling. I have prepared a style.css file and it is here, right here. I am going to apply it to our file. Okay, I save it. Here it is. Let's uh, expand this. So we have the header, the, we have the span element over here and first field, second and the phone field, the checkbox, the message and the bottom. Let's give it a try to make sure it's working. I leave the phone number blank. I check this one, or I can give it a number like this. And we have to follow the format and then supposed to be like this. And I check the checkbox and I leave a short message here. This is a test. And I click the send your message here. Here it goes. Okay, yeah. Uh, do you remember uh, I mentioned uh, we are going to send the uh, five uh, key value pairs to the server? Here they are. Allow underscore texting. We click the checkbox so it is on user underscore email which is that example email over here user underscore message this is the message and user underscore mobile this is the phone number and username it's my name over here so uh, this is how it works the test your knowledge is the next screen Form elements are more complicated than other HTML elements. Forms deserve their own standalone tutorials and require knowledge of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. In this video, we learn how to use more basic form elements. I have created a folder named uh, folder-10 and add an empty index.html file to it. I type an exclamation mark and press the tab key. Let's make a larger form. Rather than typing everything and boring you to speed things up, I will copy and paste as needed. We start with a form element with action, target, and method attributes and assign these values to it. We assign the same uh, URL uh, to the action attribute here. And 
And then uh, we set the method to post and the target attribute to underscore blank. Then we add a section element. And uh, place an H3 and the span element inside it. followed by a field set and legend elements. We give it a class attribute. We call it radio-btn. And we add a legend element here. Say please. Select one. The field set element is used to group together controls and labels that share the same purpose. It is good for styling and semantics. The legend element is added just below the start field set tag. It is like the title for the field set element and describes the field set contents. Next, we are adding three controls for radio buttons. The radio button collection is a set of checkable buttons in which only one of the buttons can be selected at a time. And all of the buttons type attributes must have a radio value and their name attributes must have the same value. We place the first radio button inside a P element. We add the label uh, element and then uh, for the four attribute, uh, we give it the value of dine in. like this. And the description of uh, and also we give it an asterisk like so. We house the input element inside the label element to render the button description before the button's field and in line, like this. The type is a radio. And uh, we set the name attribute to convenience. And then uh, the an ID attribute, we give it the value of dine dash in. And also, uh, we give it the, the value attribute. 
with the same uh, value, with the dine dash in value. And since this is the first radio button, we actually checked it like this. We give it the checked attribute. If none of the radio buttons are checked, in some browsers, the first radio button is selected as the default checked button. We check the first one right here to force the user to select their preferred option. We save the file and we add the second button as follow. Again, we nest it in a P element. As you can see, I am not using a list over here. I'm using a P element instead of it. Again, uh, I'm going to do the same thing uh, for this button. And uh, we set the for attribute to delivery. And again, uh, we nest the input uh, element inside the label element. We give it the the type uh, again is the radio. And the name, the same thing. And ID for this one is uh, delivery, the same as uh, for element. And also the value is the same. I save the file. And copy this one. And I make the changes. Uh, the, this one, the four, I, we set it to carry out. The type is radio again. And the name is convenience, the same. We gave the ID and value the same thing. We say carry out. Like this. And I save it. We gave uh, this one the description of uh, delivery. Also, we give it an asterisk. And this one, we give it the description of a uh, carry out. and also an asterisk. I save the file. Okay, let's uh, look at them on a screen. Here it is, uh, this is the heading, this is the span element. 
This is the legend element over here, and the whole thing is the uh, field set element. This is our first radio button, which we checked it on purpose. Then we have delivery and carry out. I misspelled the carry out. I'm going to fix it. Let's uh, fix this one before I forget about it. Save the file. We are good now. We continue with another field set element. We add a legend and a span elements to it. We give it a class uh, attribute also. I do some copy and paste here. Use a select element here. The select element is used to create a menu of options from which users can select one or more options depending on the setup. It can also be set to function as a drop down menu. Menu items are defined by option elements nesting inside the select element. We begin with a P element and the nest label. We give the four uh, the value of food again here. We also give the P element a class attribute. We call it the food dash P like this. And then uh, we add the select element. We also set the name to food like this. And the ID also to the same thing to food. And we give it a class attribute. And give it the value of food dash menu, like so. And also, uh, we give it multiple attribute. Uh, we want the user to be able to pick multiple items. So in order to give him that uh, uh, functionality, we add the multiple uh, attribute here, like this. Okay. And then we start uh, doing the options over here. Like this, we give it the value of a burger. I hope you guys are not hungry. And we give it the description of Burger like this. I copy it five times and we change this. We make this one cheeseburger.
this one uh, we make it chicken sandwich like that and then uh, we make this one a uh, turkey sandwich And this one we make it the uh, cheese steak. And the last one we change it to chicken cheese steak. Okay, let's uh, save it. Here it is. This is the other uh, field set element. This is the ledger. And this is the span element. And this is our menu. Following that, we add an H3 heading element and a div element as a container. We give the H3 element a class attribute with the value of uh, and the description of the beverages. Like this. We will have two field sets with legend elements inside the div element. We will place inside each field set element three controls with the type attribute that have the value of checkbox and three controls with the type attribute that have the value of number. We also give the div element a class attribute with the value of main. We give the field set a class attribute and set it to and then legend element. We give it the description of like this. We use P elements to house uh, each of the two controls. The first one for soda and the other for uh, quantity, like this. We give the P element a class attribute
Then uh, the input uh, type is a checkbox. And also uh, the name attribute uh, value is uh, Coca-Cola. Like so. And then uh, the ID attribute, uh, we set it to a small dash coca, like this. And also we have uh, the value attribute. We set it to a small, like so. Now uh, we add the label element here. We set the four attribute to a small coca. Like this. And then we give it the description of a small. Next, we do the input element, another input element. This one, uh, we set the type to number. And the name attribute to uh, Coca quantity. And ID attribute uh, to a small dash quantity like this and also we add the uh, minimum and uh, maximum elements here we say minimum we set it to zero and max we set it to nine and also we give it a value attribute over here and set it to zero. We want to start from zero. And at the end, we give it a class attribute. And we set it to drinks quantity. Like this. Okay, I save the file. So here it is the first one. As you have seen, I have one input just below the starting tag of the P element. And that's a checkbox, this checkbox. That's why I have it first. I want it to be to the left side of the rest. And then I added the label after that and gave it uh, the description of a small. This is it. That's our label. And then I add another control, the input over here, which is the type is number. That's why we have these uh, over here. And the type is number. And then uh, also uh, we had we had the minimum and maximum, so the minimum is zero. So start from zero over here. We need to add uh, another label for quantity over here. We set the four uh, attribute to a small dash uh, quantity. And then uh, we give it the description of uh, quantity like this. And I save it. Here we have it right here. Again, uh, we enter them in this order on purpose because we want them to appear on the screen like this. In this order. We do the same thing for the rest of them, so I copy and paste them. Okay. 
I save the file. Here it is. So we have uh, three items for each. Next, we add a section with an H3 heading and a span element, followed by a contact form. The contact form is almost the same as the one we made in the previous video, except there is no text area for it. We give the section a, a class attribute and set it to uh, contact. We give the H3 element also a class attribute. like this and it the description now we add the span element I do some copy and paste here Again, uh, we are using uh, the P element here, and this is the first control. It's uh, almost the same as the one we did uh, last time. Uh, and this is the email field, and this is the mobile field with the same format. And also we have the checkbox over here for opt-in for text messaging. I save it. Here it is. The reason this one is over here because if I expand it, then you see it this way. It is right here. To continue, again, we add a section with an H3 heading and a span element, followed by a select element. The select element is a drop-down menu for card payments. Contain four option elements, one for each credit card, as listed below, followed by two more controls, one for uh, the card number and one for the card expiration date. We also use a P elements as a container for each controls. We give the H3 a class attribute. like this and the description of like so and then we had the span element I do some copy and paste here here it is and then we add the first P element, starting with the label. The label, uh, we give the four attribute uh, a card value like this. And the description of card type. Thank you. 
Then we do the select element. Like this. And also we give it a class attribute. And we give the name, uh, the value of user dash card. And also we give, uh, we set the ID to card. And then uh, we give it a class attribute also. Like this one. We yeah, start with the first option. Uh, the value for this one, we set it to visa like this. And the description visa. The second one, we give it the value of MC for MasterCard. This one we give it the discover DC for value and the description like this. And the last one we give it the Amex American Express. like this. I save the file. Here we have it. Next, uh, we add the card number control and we give it the type of a tell, a placeholder, a pattern and required uh, attribute as a follow. We started again with the P element here. And then label. The label, uh, we set the four to number. And also we give it a class attribute. We give it a card dash number and the description of card number like this and uh, also an asterisk because this is required next we add the input control over here The type is, as I said, we set it to tell. And ID to number. We give it the name. We give it the value of card dash number. Next, uh, we give it a placeholder attribute. And then uh, we set the format uh, like this. So give it one, two, three, four space. 
the card numbers comes like this actually. And then uh, we give it a pattern. I'm going to do a copy and paste. And we make it the required. And also we give it a class attribute. Again, over here, uh, the format uh, for the pattern is the same as the phone number. Uh, the first four digit must be from zero to nine, and the second one the same, the third one, and the last one also. Let's save it. And here it is. The card expiration date control has a placeholder, a pattern, and a required attribute. The pattern is regular expiration. Regular expressions contain a series of characters that define a pattern of text to be matched. For more information, check online for regular expiration. Again, we start with the P element and then label. Uh, we set the four attribute to expiration. And we give it the description of expiration. and also an asterisk. Then we add the input. The type is text. And uh, we give it the ID expiration. name, we set it to expiration dash date. And we add a placeholder attribute here. We give it the value of like this. And next, uh, we add a pattern attribute. The pattern attribute, we set it to a regular expression. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste over here. And then uh, we make it required. And also we give it a class attribute. And we set it to dash width. Here it is. For the month's uh, two digit, the first part, this is the first part. If the month two digit starts with zero, the second digit must be one through nine. And the second part, it says, if it start with one, the second digit must be 
from zero through two. And therefore, uh, the month's uh, two digits cannot be zero, zero or more than 12. The year's two digits must be made from zero through nine digits. The last element of our form is a submit button. We start with the P element again. And then nest a button element inside it. The button type is submit. And uh, we give it the description of like so. And I save the file. Here it is. This is our button over here. We completed the form's coding. You can improve it, for example, by adding food prices and quantities. Or you can style it however you want. I have prepared a basic uh, style sheet and it is inside the file uh, style.css over here. I am going to apply it to our file right here. And I save it. This is uh, the form. If I expand this, here it is. Let's try it to make sure it's uh, working. I do select delivery and hamburger plus uh, chicken sandwich. For beverage, I in this one and quantity one, and then make it large with the quantity one, two for a sprite. Name. And phone number, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, eight, zero. And we check this one too for a text. We can select any card we want. How about uh, I do it discover, for instance? The card number one, two, three, four, a space, five, six, seven, a space, nine, zero, one, two. Space three four five six, the card number and the expiration date we say zero five twenty three, and then I click the button. Here it goes. All right. From the top, we have the card number. We have a Coca Cola medium. Quantity is one. Uh, we said we wanted delivery, so it is delivery. Then expiration date is 0523. And then uh, we selected hamburger and chicken sandwich. 
uh, other drinks is a Sprite, large and quantity one right here. Then I we check the text, in, yes, on. User card, uh, discover, email address, this is the email address, and mobile phone, this is the mobile phone, and name. So it's working fine. The test your knowledge is the next screen. This video concludes our HTML course. Again, just as a reminder, to learn a programming language, practice is key. The more you practice, the better you get. It is also important to remember the concept of the code and how it works. Please uh, complete them all, watch the video again and repeat them if needed until you are comfortable with them. And good luck.